I'm going to do my best to talk about addiction and how the brain and various chemicals create, perpetuate, and actually treat addiction. We're going to look a little bit at you know, what a receptor is and what neurotransmitters are. When people talk about addiction as an issue of reward and difficulty or exploitation of the reward pathway, we're going to look at that. Something that isn't quite as often looked at is, is addiction really a problem of a learning disorder or a problem associated with memories which attach to the wrong situations? Then we're going to have a break and we're going to look at FDA approved medications for the treatment of addiction and we're going to look at a few medications or substances that are up and coming and might be useful in the treatment of addiction. I am assuming that most of the people here don't prescribe medications, but I still think it's very useful to have a working knowledge of what's out there, what is it that the people you're working with are currently using or being prescribed, and what is it that maybe could be prescribed but isn't. Because as we'll discuss, there are many people out there who might benefit from medications to treat their addictive disorder but actually aren't on them. So what is a neurotransmitter and a receptor and why are they important? Essentially, no substance can lead to addiction without changing the way neurotransmitters are made, released, or bound to receptors. So banana peels aren't useful as a substance of addiction because if you eat them or smoke them or snort them or inject them, they don't bind to any particular site on the body and brain and lead to a change in neurotransmitters. Whereas a substance like heroin binds to a very specific neurotransmitter or a substance like alcohol seems to bind and modify multiple different receptors. So a neurotransmitter is a chemical substance such as acetylcholine or dopamine, that transmits nerve impulses across a synapse. So it's the message that goes from place to place. A receptor is kind of like a place where a boat could dock. And the boat itself can be either the neurotransmitter or the substance from the outside that goes into the dock. A receptor is a structure, so this would be a receptor in which something binds, and this would be the substance. And it could be a substance that your body makes, or it could be a substance that one ingests by multiple different routes. Once that binding happens, different things can occur. So something might bind to a receptor, and now that receptor will release lots of neurotransmitters. Or maybe that receptor will send a signal that says, well, let's stop eating up the neurotransmitter. Or it might send a signal that says, stop what you're doing. Or it might send a signal that says, keep doing what you're doing. Here are some of the neurotransmitters that we're going to talk about. So if you've been to another talk on addiction, you've probably heard a lot about dopamine. And we commonly think of that as the master neurotransmitter of reward. When dopamine goes up, the body has the sense that something good or rewarding has happened. And almost every single substance, which is what we're focusing on, but even process like gambling, sex, eating, that can lead to an addictive or addictive like disorder, does so through the elevation of <coughs> dopamine. Serotonin, which was first uh, really gaining popularity when the medication Prozac was developed, because Prozac is a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, or SSRI, which means that serotonin, which is one of the happy neurotransmitters, is left out there and there's more of it, or at least the brain perceives that there's more of it because the cell isn't taking it up and destroying it. So serotonin is important for mood. It's important for helping people have that sense of happiness or well-being. It turns out that having enough serotonin is also important to regulating levels of anxiety. 
but we're going to talk about it mostly as a neurotransmitter that is really important in memory. And one of the things that substances of abuse do is exploit serotonin's ability to create memories. We're going to talk a little bit about GABA. GABA is one of the most common neurotransmitters, and you can think of it as the sedation or the blanket system of the brain. So gamma is that blanket which calms things down. And some of the substances you'll recognize that uh, either uh, mimic GABA or change how much GABA is around are things like alcohol or things like alprazolam, also known as Xanax. Those substances are very important when it comes to GABA, or GABA is very important as to why those substances are addictive. Glutamate. Now, this is excitatory, but not excitatory necessarily in a good way. This is excitatory as in, I can't sleep, I'm really restless. You know, for some people, maybe being on the top of a cliff and looking down, that's exciting in a good way. But for a lot of people, being on a cliff and looking down is exciting in a bad way. And glutamate is more like that, exciting in a bad way. Now, it's important to have glutamate because you can imagine if you had lots of this GABA around and you didn't have any glutamate, you might be asleep too often. And so GABA and glutamate work on balancing each other. And we'll talk a little bit about how glutamate is important because if there's too much of it around and you feel bad, there's that drive to change the way you feel. You don't want to feel bad anymore. Endorphins. <laughs> So endorphins are, are that neurotransmitter that is important for that sense of well-being. It is our natural way of blocking pain. It is our body's opiate. This is our body's heroin or morphine. Um, for me, I can never see that word. When I first heard about that word, I must have been you know, maybe pre-adolescent. And I heard this word endorphin. And for whatever reason, it reminded me of Smurfs. And so whenever anyone talks about endorphins, I think about little Smurfs wandering around in the brain and they're very happy. So now maybe I've implanted that in you and you can think about endorphins and think about Smurfs if you remember uh, uh, what, who they were or what they were. Endo, endocannabinoids, say that five times really fast, endocannabinoids. So you might recognize a little bit of a word in there. It looks a little bit like cannabis, um, which is a more scientific way of referring to pot or marijuana. Well, remember how I talked about that banana peels, I've never worked with anybody who was addicted to banana peels because banana peels, well, they don't bind anywhere. So for marijuana, for cannabis to be a substance of abuse or dependence, it must have some place to bind. And it turns out that we're now discovering and characterizing the places that marijuana binds. And if it has a place to bind, there must be a substance that the body makes that's like it. And so it turns out that your body makes things a little bit like cannabis called endocannabinoids. What's kind of interesting about this receptor is that it's very important for circulatory regulation. So we're going to talk a lot about uh, receptors and neurotransmitters, things in the brain. But all of the receptors that I'm talking about actually aren't specific to the brain. Many of them exist on the intestine or on the blood vessels or on the muscles or other places in the body. And that helps to explain why drugs, when you're either intoxicated or using them or withdrawing from them, have so many side effects that aren't just emotional. So think, for example, about opiates. And people who are using opiates get constipated. Well, that has to do with the effect of opiates on the intestine. And sure enough, when they withdraw, they get the opposite of constipated in an incredibly uncomfortable way. Uh, when we think about um, uh, endocannabinoids, there's been a lot of research looking at whether, um, and I'll talk more about this, so if this kind of isn't sinking in, don't worry, we're going to come back to it. Whether if you use 
uh, a cannabinoid from the outside or whether you block this receptor, what that does to cardiovascular health. And so remind me if I don't come back to that, to come back to this question of should we have concerns about the cardiovascular effects of marijuana based on this receptor. And then we have the nicotinic uh, receptor, which increases heart rate, seems to improve memory and concentration. So uh, one of the reasons why people continue to smoke is that they experience some stimulation associated with that activity. And actually, paradoxically, also experience some calmness associated with that activity. We're going to talk about the different ways something binds to a receptor. Because just because you know, this chemical fits in this hole doesn't mean that uh, it automatically does the same thing. And we're going to talk about the three different ways that something can interact with a receptor. Um, this isn't necessarily the only three ways, but it's the three most important. So we have agonists. Agonists, like the hero of our story, bind to a receptor, they fit in really nicely, and they activate the receptor. So whatever the receptor would have done with its natural endorphin or its endocannabinoid or its GABA, an agonist is something from the outside that fits in and mimics the action of the natural chemical. Now, there's something called a partial agonist, and that fits in. It seems to activate the receptor, and it may activate it a little bit, or it may activate it a lot, but it also at the same time blocks. Or let's say for an agonist, the activity goes on, 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 on. But a partial agonist turns it on, 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 and then reaches a ceiling in which it doesn't go on anymore. And then we have the antagonist. Well, the antagonist, as they are in many stories, is obstructive. It manages to bind to this receptor, but then it blocks it. And the way we use that, primarily in the treatment of addiction, is it can block the occurrence of not just natural trans, uh, chemicals binding to the receptor, but also things from the outside. So you can use a drug, but it doesn't have an effect because there's some antagonist that is blocking it from being able to do what it does. So we have the agonist, which turns it on, the partial agonist, which turns it on some and also has a ceiling effect and may block it, and then we have the antagonist that blocks it all together. Here is another look at some of these neurotransmitters, but also how they're important in addiction. We talked about how dopamine is the neurotransmitter of reward, and it is important to uh, creating and perpetuating addiction in all substances. It also, as we'll look at a little bit, is important in creating and perpetuating addiction to sex, food, gambling, and non-substance addictions. We have stimulatory neurotransmitters like epinephrine and norepinephrine, and things like cocaine and methamphetamine bind to or uh, change the distribution of these two neurotransmitters. Um, serotonin, we talked about how it's important for mood, learning, and memory. It's important to probably most substances, but it has special importance to M MDMA, which is ecstasy, and to alcohol. And as I mentioned, it is also a neurotransmitter we regulate by the use of selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors like Prozac, Paxil, uh, Lexapro. We have GABA, which is that blanket, that quiet, sedation, inhibition, alcohol, and sedatives. And then we have glutamate. Now, nobody uses a substance that mimics glutamate because they love the way that glutamate feels. Glutamate is important because when you stop using some of the drugs, the levels of glutamate go way up. And that's a part of withdrawal syndromes. None of us loves to feel bad. And to the person with the addictive disorder in particular, feeling bad 
is very intolerable. And it's these levels of glutamate that make feeling bad even worse. Endorphins, important with opiates, but also important with alcohol. Endocannabinoids, important with marijuana and nicotinic receptors, important with nicotine. 